Um, Mark, Mark Headley, welcome to the show. Mark, uh, of course, is an ex-Scientologist. He is the best-selling author of Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. I'm Ethan McKinnon. We're going to do another Scientology show. Before we start, actually, Mark, you know what? I said yeah. this to Tony Ortega like a month ago. I'm actually, I'm, I get nervous about doing these shows because I, you hear so many horror stories and you see, obviously, read your book and stuff like that. Are we on, on some kind of watch list now by the OSA or are, like, am I being monitored? <laughs> I seriously doubt it. They, their bark is a lot uh, louder than their, uh, harder than their bite. Is this something that perhaps would have happened uh, maybe 10 years ago, but now it's not as uh, prevalent? Well, I think there's just too many people that they can't go after every single person. Yeah. It's just, it's just too many. They don't have enough resources to... They don't care to, about you, Ethan. <laughs> that's, that's for the longest time. I actually thought that, like, even in the early days, in, like, the early 2000s, I thought... They don't give it. They don't care about me. I'm just one little guy. Um, and then over the years, I found out how many different people they had watching us, and I was like, "Oh my god, that's insane." Okay, well let's uh, <laughs> let's do a show. Then here we go. Yo, it's Ethan McKinley's questionable. Hit the music. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> Okay, Mark. Yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on, sir. I like. I remember, like, God, I, I heard you on Coast to Coast. Like, was it eight years ago now, or nine, six, oh, seven wait. years ago? And I read the book in two thousand and ten. But it seems to have had this confluence now recently with like Mike Rinder's deflection, defection a few years ago. Obviously, he was was he second in command, I believe, or one of the top well, three or four people at the top after David Miscavige and things, right? Yeah, he was. Uh, he held a lot of different positions over the years, but he was definitely uh, one of the main movers and shakers that was there at the uh, international headquarters. Well, for anyone listening, uh, Mark, of course, grew up in Scientology, right? You went to Scientology schools. Both your parents were in Scientology. Even though they got divorced, you still remained in Scientology. There was no kind of disconnection from them or trying to pull you out of a Scientology school, right? No, my, my mother was involved in Scientology from, oh. from when I was about seven years old. And so I went to Scientology schools. Um, I grew up I, I grew up across the street from the Celebrity Center in Hollywood. And how do uh, they differ? How does it differ from a regular state school? If you went to a regular school, I guess, like I did. What how was it? How does what is a Scientology taught school? Well, they use all of L. Ron Hubbard's uh, Scientology technology in the school so in scientology you have you do what's called courses so when you would learn a subject in scientology you would have what's called a check sheet it's essentially just a list of items that you do in an exact order and throughout that you do uh demonstrations with clay and you do demonstrations using a demo kit which is a, a scientology study technique mm. and so what they do in the scientology school is they just take everything that you do in Scientology and they they use that to teach you math and science and, uh, you know, reading and writing and all those things. And they also teach you Scientology study techniques. They teach you Scientology uh, ethics and justice procedures. And so it's basically like a, a primer or like a, a starter kit for becoming a Scientologist. Sure. If, you, if you went to a Scientology school during your schooling, then when you go over to the Scientology organization and do a course, you're already grooved in. You're already doing every single thing. The indoctrination has already been done. Um, in so terms if you of had how a desire to perhaps be an artist or something or do something, maybe you wanted to work in movies, would that have been allowed or would you have had to go, as you did at 16, you went to work at the International Base or Gold Base in Riverside well, County, California. Is yeah, that, for me, I was recruited for the Sea Organization from the Scientology School. So Sea Organization members, these are the people that signed the billion-year contracts. Just to explain to anyone listening what the Sea Org is, because it's a, kind of a paramilitary group in a sense, isn't it? L. Ron Hubbard kind of like uh, had you all dressing up in the kind of like the, I guess, the, the naval outfits and things. Yeah, and, it's the Scientology. It's the Scientology fake Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Why was it created in the first place? I think it was basically created because they were they were not able to operate in any land-based uh, facilities because they were always being uh, lit up by the government or the police or the FBI or depending. It didn't matter what country they went to. 
uh, people were like sniffing it out, saying there's something something rotten here, and then they'd get they'd get lit up, or they'd get busted, or they'd get kicked out, and and even when they went to sea, they would often get thrown out of ports. Mm. So they would they would the the ship would be docked somewhere, and they'd be throwing rocks at the boat, and they'd have to you know pull the pull the ropes and and get the heck out of there. So <laughs> the the sea aspect of it was so they could evade capture and detection that's right. really one and when you're in the sea org you learn all about the 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 sea org is supposed to be what l ron hubbard deemed as fabian so they didn't know where you were where you were coming from where you were going to it was sort of this mysterious thing the sea org was supposed to be and then essentially it got so big that they couldn't operate at the sea and they had to move which ended up being when they moved this is a very interesting piece of history because they they moved to land, and when they moved to land, um, they moved to Clearwater. Mm. And when when the Sea Org was at sea, it was called Flag. The main ship was the flagship. So that's the flag was, building, isn't it? That's what I got confused with when we spoke previously well, in Clearwater. When they were Florida. at sea, it was called the flagship Apollo, and that's the ship that L. Ron Hubbard ran. And when they moved to land, they and they moved to Clearwater. That's how the name of Clearwater became the Flag Land Base. That's the that's the name of it, and that's the reason it's called the Flag Land Base. Sure, is because that was their transition from sea uh, to land. So, to anyone who doesn't know what Scientology is, someone asked me this the other day. Actually, I said you were coming on there. Like, well, what is Scientology? And I got about a minute in, and then I just lost my tracks. I couldn't kind of describe what it was it's like it's a learning thing and whenever you've heard Cruz or Travolta talk about it in interviews they go oh just read a book read Dynetics when I used to read like I used to like I'm a huge fan of Tom Cruise I can't lie he does awesome films I'm not sure how you well we'll get to how you feel about him I guess but uh, I was a fan of him as a kid obviously growing up as many I guess young people were and he'd, you'd read about uh, him in interviews and he'd say oh yeah I do Scientology now and stuff and the, the journalist would ask what it was and he'd go oh you have to read Dynetics read a book and this very kind of standoffish, almost uh, pathological need for secrecy in a sense that they can't ever tell you exactly what it is and you have to read a book. So could you give me, to anyone listening and me, the Disney version, if you're allowed to, if you're allowed to say it, but a Scientologist, if they're allowed to say what it was, what is Scientology, the Disney version, not what it actually is because we're going to get to that, but what if you had to tell someone and sell it as a kind of, woo, this is cool, what is it? Well, you know, L. Ron Hubbard was asked that exact same question. Can you tell us what Scientology is? And in an interview, in the I think it was in the 60s, and he said, well, that's like trying to answer, you know, what's in the Encyclopedia Britannica answer yeah. in, in one sentence. It's so that spin that they always give, and it's very confusing yeah. in the end, yeah. And it is because... There's so it's so there's so many layers to the onion that is Scientology that it's it's very hard to tell you well this is what it is and even when you go into a Scientology organization there's 20 different films that they have to tell you what Scientology is okay. and all the different parts of it so you there's not even one film that they have that can tell you. What is it? And when, when I w we worked at the international headquarters, we were I worked at Golden Era Productions, which was the audiovisual arm of Scientology. We did all of their promotional videos. We did all of the audiovisual products, the yeah. lecture, the DVDs. We, and many times throughout the 15 years that I worked there, we were tasked with producing a film that was called What is Scientology? <laughs> this film... In the 15 years that I was there, there was probably, I'd say, four to five different iterations of scripts, uh, film shot, everything. It, it has never to this day been completed because sure. there's, it's, there's never a film, not even one film that they can make that's, that they think is good enough to explain what Scientology is. So, But the short answer, the real answer, is it's a cult masquerading as a religion which is actually a business that okay. is exactly what it is it, it is a cult they are masquerading as a religion 
And in fact, they're really a money-making business. And that, that's exactly what it is. And on the surface, they are a series of courses that you do to improve yourself in terms of, like uh, Cruz mentions, it cl uh, cured his dyslexia. I'm not sure how that is possible because I'm dyslexic. Uh, I've not yeah. done a Scientology course, so maybe that's a moot point, but uh, I'm not sure if you actually cure yourself of that. Uh, well, that's, a, that's another one of the things that, depending on who you talk to and depending on uh, your view on Scientology, the, even the part where they help you, I would even, I would even debate how much that's true. Because mm. one of the things that they do is they, they have this thing called a personality test, which is 100% rigged to make you introvert I've had and, look, <laughs> and look inwards I and, think I and they figure out based on what you've told them, they basically smoke out what your weaknesses are. Yeah. That's what that test does. It doesn't tell you anything about your personality. It tells Scientology what you think that your weaknesses are so that they can basically hone in on that and, and hard sell you on the thing that they know you think is your problem. Whether it's your problem or not, it's what you think your problem or problems are. And then they tell you, we have a course, like let's say you have a problem with relationships. Sure. They're, they smoke this out from the personality test and they say, we have a course that you can do that will help you in relationships. And that course is 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever it is. And then in the course of doing that course, you find out 10 other problems that you didn't even know you had right. that you now are made aware of that you have. And then there's a whole slew of courses to do those that maybe cost you 1500 bucks. And then essentially what happens is five years later, after your second divorce, and you've now spent 300,000 pounds or dollars or shekels <laughs> or whatever, you find out, you know what? I have 100 problems I didn't know I had. And I just went through my second divorce, so I'm still I still have a problem with relationships. You get a refund on your first course, then, right? Yeah, no. It, so <laughs> essentially, they sort of set this. They they. I've explained this to a few different people, but I think a best way to describe it is that they give you a deck of cards, and then you pay them to have them have you set this deck of cards up around yourself. But they don't. You don't know how to get out of the this little maze that you've set up. Sure. They do, and and you've paid them to build this maze around you. And they just and keep you, adding on more yeah, and more and more. And you just keep building it more and more and more. And then you get your family involved, and now they're they're stuck in this with you. And that now all your business associates, and now they're all stuck in this thing with you. And now you all these people that are in your life have these mazes built around them. And, and, and you have all paid them to, to set this up, but they're the only ones who have the blueprint on how to get you out of this maze. And until you realize that, you're stuck. The second you realize that it's, it's just a house of cards, it just falls apart. It sure. literally falls apart around you. And that's this decompression or deprogramming that takes place. You have to realize that there, there's no real... There's no, you're not going to, all your future eternities are not uh, going to be destroyed. Your family will be fine. You'll be fine. Everyone, it, mm. your life will be fine if you walk away. Mm. That's, that's the biggest thing that, that's the biggest mm. leverage that they have is once they get all your family and all your business associates and everyone around you in your life, once you're all involved in Scientology, you can't leave mm. because well, if you leave, then you'll be cut off from all those people. So they have what's called a. Uh, suppressive person. Well, that's they, that's the it's SP, isn't it? I've heard that abbreviated. You've heard it in that that's like right. that famous Tom Cruise leaked video, and he says that's an SP, and we can solve everyone's problems. And I know I'm the only one that can help and stuff. It's that kind of like uh, it's a secret language in a sense, isn't it? What does SP mean for anyone listening? A, a, an SP or a suppressive person is anyone in Scientology or outside side of Scientology that either disagrees with Scientology that's spoken out against Scientology mm. or who's said anything derogatory or it, anything defamatory about Scientology, you can be deemed a suppressive person. Or if you do something in Scientology, like if you work for them and you do something bad, they have 150 different things that qualify as a, uh, they have misdemeanors, crimes, high crimes, suppressive acts, 
that can you can if you do any of those several hundred things you can immediately you know boom baba baba booey you're now a suppressive person sure just by doing any of those things once you've, so, been, once you've been declared that can you come back from that and be welcome back into the fold is that kind of a permanent mark against you whether you're in or out of scientology they have a system of steps that they make very very hard to do mm. and and essentially you have to admit that you were evil, you broke the law, you uh, you did all these bad things. And after you've done all that, and possibly, depending on what you did to become declared suppressive, it is possible to undeclare yourself a suppressive. And, and, we've, and I've known many people who've done this, and one of the ways that they were, uh, they got out of being a, declared a suppressive person was to spy on me for the church. Sure. That... The church said, if you spy on Mark Headley, then you can, you'll be undeclared a suppressive person and you can speak to your family again. Your record again. will be expunged, essentially. Yeah, yeah. and then and as, long as, you, as long as you don't do anything bad with, to us again, then we'll leave you and you can talk to your family and we don't care. Sure, because each one of the audits, it, well, aud it's called auditing, isn't it? Every time you go in and have a, a meeting about any of your problems or what you want to accomplish or what you need to do, it's done with an e-meter which is this kind of like, is it like a, a very crude lie detector? You hold two kind of metal cans with bits of wire coming out, and there's a very famous picture of Travolta doing that uh, back in the day. Yeah. And then someone has a file on you and monitors it. You tell them your innermost secrets, your sexual proclivities, perversions, what, what have you. Everything's out there laid on the table, and it goes into a file. Uh, I imagine that happened at Gold Base, where you eventually got drafted into and working. But what is the e-meter exactly? Is it a, a real thing? Is it a legit piece of technology, or is it just a, a parlor trick, snake oil salesman stuff? It's sort of a parlor trick. You can there's arguments for and against it, but it's a very very crude electronic device, right? And and it, it also falls al along this thing that I was talking about before: is that if you believe it works, then hmm. it sort of works. But as soon as you don't think it works anymore, it doesn't work. So it's kind of like if I told you, I know. It's uh, cartoon physics. If you run off yeah. a cliff in a cartoon and you don't look down, you don't fall yeah. down like the Roadrunner cartoons. But if you do, if you don't exactly. look down, you'll, st you'll stay floating in midair. It's also sort of a, it's, it plays into uh, like an, a faction of hypnotism as well. So some people can easily be hypnotized. A certain amount of the population, a hypnotist, a very well-trained hypnotist, within an hour can have somebody under a deep trance. And then there's an, their, their best friend, they might not after many weeks be able to do anything and get them to do anything in terms of being under hypnosis. So it's sort of a lot of the, the early indoctrination that you do in Scientology, it sets you up, it sort of sets you up to open up the 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 channels or the lines so that you can be indoctrinated further and you can easily be uh, brainwashed to believe certain things and once you get into this mindset and once you believe that the meter is reading your thoughts then when you have a thought that you don't want them to find out about you have certain manifest manifestations or you do certain things physically that are the telltales that mm -hmm. let them know okay, yeah, right there, you just had something that was a secret thought, tell me what that is. Sure. And then they can, they, can, they can really get a lot of stuff out, out of you that you wouldn't normally tell a person. Yeah, it's strange that it works on so many people. Like Jason Begay, a famous actor that obviously left, I think, in 2007. Uh, Tom Cruise, obviously, John Travolta, Kirsty Alley. These are obviously like very intelligent people who are kind of uh, travel the world, they work extensively, they're famous. How they would fall for that, I have no idea. Paul Haggis, of course, who uh, obviously left. Uh, I think one of the main things that they use is they find people that want to help other people, that genuinely want to help or do things to help mankind or to help their family or to do better. It's someone who genuinely has an interest to do something good they take advantage of that good-natured part of that person, and that is the part that that they they just milk that part and they they work it, and that is how they get some of these people. And and like I said before, in that personality test thing, yeah, they find out like 
no matter how intelligent you are or know how, how matter how uh, productive or successful you are as an actor or an actress or whatever whatever field you're in, there is some part of you that could be broken that you feel horrible that you haven't been able to fix that certain part of your life. As soon as they find out what that is, that that piece is, they use that to draw you in. Right. And that so for instance, Kirstie Alley, she was a drug addict. She's readily admitted that she used to do cocaine piles of cocaine well that's how they got her into scientology was they told her hey listen we can help you with that it's narconon right no, through narconon exactly and so and and the purification rundown which is essentially the exact same program you do at their narconon drug rehabilitation it's just a scientology detoxification thing that has never medically been proven to do a single thing um, and there's a lot of controversy surrounding that. But for Kirstie Alley, once they did that with her, and, and they very may well have helped her with her drug addiction. Mm. So that doesn't mean the other 90% of the stuff they do is horrible and wrong. It, it, it isn't horrible and wrong. But they use that one little piece to lure her in. Same thing with John Travolta. John Travolta, as far as I, if I remember correctly, I think this all happened when I was, you know, an infant, but in the seventies, he, he suffered a terrible loss of his girlfriend or wife at the time had died mm. and he was in a horrible place and they used that. And that's how they got him in. They said, listen, we can help you, uh, you know, be happy again after you've suffered this terrible loss. So for anything that you have a problem with in life, they have something, they have a little piece of something that is the cheese that goes along with that problem. And they draw you in with that little piece of cheese. Richard Gere flirted with this back in the day. Is that his, I've, you, you obviously have the uh, very famous Richard Gere gerbil story. Is that tied to Scientology at all as a way of smearing him? Because I understand he flirted with uh, Scientology in the early 80s and then I left. Is that any, true? I don't have any information about that, but I know personally that from being there, if you say... You, you did so-and-so, and then you defect, you can most certainly expect that that so-and-so thing is going to come up, and it's just going to mysteriously be leaked. Or is that, put what, on is that what keeps Travolta in the church? Because obviously he's had some uh, lifestyle choices that perhaps Scientology wouldn't agree with, that he's tried to keep quiet, not that we'll mention him on the show, and smear him. But uh, yeah. Some I'm of the stories sure. that have leaked out and photos that have leaked out, is that connected to Scientology or just kind of just his complacency? Like these think, masseuse stories and things. Yeah, I think, I mean, those are, I mean, it's sort of hard if you say, I shop at this store and everyone sees you shopping at another store all the time. It's sort of like, okay, we know he wants us to think he shops at this store, but everybody <laughs> knows he really shops at this store. So, I think every single person is different, but what you there's no way that we could hear about him shopping at the other store all the time, sure. and that he doesn't actually he hasn't shopped there once or twice. But at the same time, I don't care. I don't care what store he shops at. It doesn't no, I, matter. I don't, I don't think anyone it does. Matter. It doesn't I don't, matter to me. Yeah, but no. it does. But it might matter to him. Mm. That's all that matters, and that's sort of another thing that they play on is they'll they'll tell all sorts of horrible stories about people who leave. And a lot of times people go, oh, I don't care. I don't care if that person did that or did this. It doesn't really matter. It's the person that they're doing this to sure. that's supposed to have the effect on it. And they're trying to shut them up or shut them down by, by doing this. And, and also, if you've done 50 so-and-sos and they've leaked one, well, if you keep talking, they're certainly going to leak another five and then another 10. And then so they'll keep going they're, They don't they, they I don't think they have a line that they won't cross. Mm -hmm. I don't I, I don't know that there is such a line. I've seen stories about judges, dogs being poisoned and the the lug nuts on my lawyer. My lawyer's car were loosened in his driveway. They loosened all the lug nuts on his car one day or or somebody did mm. um, plausible deni deniability yeah so and I've had pri private investigators follow me in California in Florida in Utah in Colorado so it doesn't matter where you go I, even in Germany I went mm. to Germany for a government conference on Scientology 
and they had two private investigators in the two seats in front of us on the plane there. Is it so, still banned in Germany? No, no, no. They, they, they operate in Germany, and for several years they operated there under heavy scrutiny and sort of being watched over. But the amount of followers they have in any country is so minimal mm. that it really, the only reason that they're still around is because they have, they have a certain core group of donors that have unlimited amount of funds. Mm. So they can give them 10 million, they can give them 20 million, they can give them 50 million, and, and they're a tax-free organization in most of the countries with they, which they operate. So they have, a, they have this C organization, which when I worked for the C organization for 15 years, I was paid anywhere from zero to $45 a week. Right. So in the 15 years that I worked there, I have a, a statement that I got from the U.S. government that said that the entire 15 years that I worked there, at over 100 hours a week, seven days a week, most cases 365 days a year, for 15 years I was paid $29,000. <laughs> How is that possible? That can't be that's real. Like, that's like three work weeks every week. Yeah, but how, 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 how is the government not coming? Like, it's obviously got tax-exempt status now, but even back then, it. how did they not come that's after you guys and go, this guy's not working, he's not adding it. to the tax of the country and stuff? How is that? How is it possible? How would they get around that? How do they not pay you? How do you live? We, I, well, this not, is a, not, by the way, this to everyone listening, well, this is at the international base, Ground Zero, where you began uh, and were drafted into work from the age of sixteen, right? This, yeah, is, this where, is the headquarters yeah. of all of Scientology internationally. The Eye of Sauron, all of, where all of the organizations are run from in the entire world. We were getting paid, and on a good week, we were making forty-five bucks a week for a hundred plus hours a week. So. They obviously they paid for our our, our room. Mm -hmm. they, they paid for where we stayed, and they gave us three meals a day. Did you get medical? Minimal. And if if the insurance would cover it, or if uh, they have what's called workman's comp, so if you fall down on the job, um, you can the the government will pay for that um, so that injury. But there was there were things that happened when I was there that. I needed medical attention. I did not get medical attention, and I just had to, you know, s s suffer it out until I got better. But regardless, that averages out to about thirty-six cents an hour. Mm. So, so like I was saying, they're tax-free. They don't have to pay. Uh, they're all this money is coming in. That's do it's their donations. They're mm. not giving anything for most of the money that comes in, and they have an immense labor force that they pay thirty-six cents an hour to do work so if you factor all those things in do you pay there's... do you pay tax on that or do they garnish anything out of that for themselves again out of you to take another skim off the top no i did i paid about i think it's about five bucks so what they were paying us was fifty dollars a week so after taxes i got 45 right <laughs> i read somewhere you had to you had your wages skimmed again though to pay for like uh, things gifts for david miscavige the uh, leader of scientology Oh, yeah. Depending on what year it was, uh, it was anywhere from five or ten bucks a week to sometimes like it was, if it was a birthday or Christmas, sometimes you'd have to do like several weeks of pay to pay for the gift. Right. So he would get a camera that was worth more than what I made in two years. Right. He would get one gift. But there was. There was three, four hundred of us at that one property. And then at all the different sea organization installations all over the world, there was probably up to about 5,000 Sea Org members around the entire world. So if you pooled all of their income for several weeks. It's a nice Armani suit. Yeah, he could get himself a pair of Italian shoes for that. And then, uh, you know, woohoo! You, if you gave 150 bucks for three weeks, and so did another three or 400 people, and some dude got a pair of shoes, you, I mean, that that doing that over years and years and years, you wonder why the people that leave they call them disgruntled. You'll be like, well, yeah, I'm a bit disgruntled. So yeah, you paid me 45 bucks a week, and then you took a few weeks so you could get a pair of leather shoes. So for 50 bucks a week, how many hours would you work, and what were your roles there? What job did you actually do? Well, I would work from, we would get, I'll tell you the schedule. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. And I remember it. I did it for so many years. I remember it like uh, back of my hand. So we would get on a bus 
to travel to the property at 745. Whoa. And then we would get to the where we work, the main work area, by 8 o'clock. Then from 8 to 8.30, if we were good, we'd get a half-hour breakfast. And then from 8.30 to noon, we would work. And then from noon, and depending on if we were schmucks or deemed schmucks or not by David Miscavige, we'd either get a 15-minute lunch or a 30-minute lunch. Then at, And then after that, we would work until 5 o'clock. And then depending on if we were schmucks or not, we would work for, we would have a 15 minute meal break or a half an hour meal break. And sometimes in the really like just rich years, we had a 45 minute meal break. That was that we were living the life then. What and would then you being a schmuck? Was it easy to fall from grace? Yeah. Yeah. If, if we didn't get a list of things done that Dave Miscavige wanted done, then everybody on the property would have 15 minute meal breaks and that could last for a week, a month, or an entire year. Because he used to live on the property goal base, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where his main living quarters would be. So, but hold on, I'm not done. So then we would work from five, like after dinner, so 5.15, 5.30, 5.45, depending on the state of uh, the, the property at that time. We would work from 5.45 until 11 o'clock at night. And sometimes we would do exercise at 11 to 11.30 or from 10.30 to 11. And then we would, between, on a good day, we would leave at 11.30 to 12, 11, between 11 and 12, we'd go home and then start the whole thing over again the next day. So, you so that was five that hours was a, sleep. Well, yeah, if you got, if you got to, if you got home to around midnight and went straight to bed, if you got up at 6.30 or 7, you could get seven hours of sleep. Woohoo! Sure. You're not doing anything when you get home except for, you know, shit, shower, and shave, and, and boom, hit the bunk. But um, but that was pretty much a normal day. Now, if there was a production crunch or there was one of these lists of things that David Miscavige wanted done, well, then there was another bus that would leave at 3 o'clock in the morning. So you wouldn't go at the 11 o'clock bus. You'd go on the 3 o'clock bus. And then if you didn't make the 3 o'clock bus, because we didn't have uh, people there – Maybe there was like, let's say there was, during the time that I was there, there was anywhere from 750 to 1,000 people working at this property. Does, not actually, does no one actually live on the base like full time? Now, now they all live on the property because there's too many people who are escaping when they had a you. park. <laughs> well, me and about 500 other people. So when I left, when I, went, when I got there in the early 90s, there was nearly, I'd say 800 to 900 people at that property. Right. When I left in 2005, I would say there was about 400 people on that property, right. maybe less. So 300 people either got kicked off or escaped in a period of 15 years. So, um, but regardless, um, so if you didn't get that, so the, most of the people there didn't have vehicles. So I'd say out of the 800 people that were there, maybe, maybe 50 had cars. Mm. And then if you were, if they thought you were going to try and take off or escape, then you weren't allowed to drive your car. Right. So your car just sat there on the property somewhere. So if you miss that midnight bus or that three o'clock in the morning bus, you just stay all night and maybe crash at your desk or maybe just work all night long. I would say during the 15 years that I was there, I probably pulled maybe a thousand all nighters, Whoa. a thousand, like Working all night would sometimes be what we did for weeks on end. We just wouldn't go home. There was a period of time. So where would you sleep? I mean, you, you worked in the media mats. kind of areas of the media department, right? making videos and promotional stuff. Or did you do other things leading up to that point? Did you work your way up? Because it's yeah, like golden worked. era productions, right? Yeah, I worked as a production manager over the film shooting area. I was the what what you would call in the industry as a first and a first assistant director sure. i was also the pre-production director so when i was the pre-production director i was restricted to the property for a year almost a year and what they did you I'm, what did you witness while you were there because what was causing apart from the long hours and the low pay what was causing the people to actually leave what were you guys witnessing on a daily basis how were you treated i mean it was it's kind of like mind control in a sense the stuff i've read very much like mk ultra sleep deprivation uh this oh, mu yeah. musical chairs that we'll get to in a few minutes but uh all what, that <laughs> what things were you seeing exactly 
<laughs> everything. I mean, I've seen people get beat up. I've seen people. We had a lake there that people would get thrown into the lake. They would actually read like a little incantation before they'd throw you in. They would say, uh, may your overts be cast to the waters and all this. And then they throw you into the lake because that's what Hubbard used to do when they were at sea. Hmm. He would throw people off the side of the boat and it was called overboarding. Well, because we were in the middle of the desert, we didn't have a, anywhere to overboard somebody. So they were like, David, this is David Miscavige. He says, you know what? Take him down to the lake. We had this really nasty lake that had dead animals and kind of muddy, murky water. And it was a little island that you could walk out to. And they'd do the little, little, little saying, and they'd just throw you off and push you into the lake. And you'd, you have to slog your way back up to the shore. That, that would happen on a regular basis. Um, I mean, in my book, I go into excruciating detail into insane amounts of stuff that happened there. But I've seen, I've pretty much seen and and watched the worst that I've ever seen in my whole life. It, it all happened at that property. And when I left in 2005, I was basically under the impression that I would rather be dead than to stay here. I would feel I would feel better, and I would be more happy in my life if I was dead. That's that's how horrible of a place it was to, to exist, that it was just, a, it was agonizing. Just between the no sleep and uh, just the constant abuse and the yelling and the fighting and the just the torture and the name calling and the humiliation and all the things that happened at that place. I mean, you, are, saw, you, saw, you said you saw David Miscavige attack and beat people. Were you one of these people? What would trigger he only, the uh, David he Miscavige? Only, he only struck me on two different occasions. On one of those occasions, he kicked me in the ass. Like he literally told me to turn around and he kicked me in the ass. On the other <laughs> occasion, I I had said something that really pissed him off and he punched me like multiple times in the face with both just... Wasn't there and, something inside that would snap and just go back at it? Because if you hit someone, they'll come back at you, right? Not if they have a bunch of people around them. Like right. when I, when after he punched me that one time and I stood back up and kind of regained myself, I was going to go, I was like, okay, let's do this. And as soon as I, as soon as I didn't even say anything, it's just the look in my eyes. He had a bunch of people escort me out of the building. Like I got <laughs> grabbed, I got grabbed and escorted out of the building because, and when I was walking out, he said, did you see that? He was going to hit me back like the gall of him to think that he could even hit me back. That was so that was sort of the the mindset that you would just take it because mm. even after that happened, it was sort. that's when I had I, I pr probably had an epiphany at that moment. Like this guy is the leader. He's the top. And he just beat, he just punched me 20 times like that. There's probably no way to come back from that, really. Like that that's it. If if you were if you if you're if you're a Catholic and the Pope beats you up, then it's like, well that's that's that. You know, you're doomed. There's yeah. no there's no coming back from the Pope uh, getting into a fist fight with you. So uh, you need to you need to you need to pick another religion or you need to go work somewhere else. And and it's also once it happens, there is a stigma that is attached to you. There there's <laughs> I need there's, a bit. <laughs> there's, 20, there's 25 people just watch this happen. Uh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna go unnoticed. Like, yeah. no one's gonna be that, your friend because they don't want to get yeah. kind of tarred with the same brush or associated with, uh, you know, bad yeah, boy David, Mark. David Miscavige hit you, and you were gonna hit him back. That's not a good. That's not a good place to be. Mm. Uh, you know, in that in that environment. So. But, um, but yeah, no, I've seen him, I've seen him hit Mike Rinder and, uh, Mark Yeager and Guillaume. I mean, I don't know how PG this show is. You can swear, do it. You can fucking do anything okay. you want. It's okay. So, so, <laughs> so there are two individuals for probably for the entire time that I were there were, no, I guess, number, number two, number three, number four, number five in there somewhere. There was a gentleman by the name of Guillaume Lesev. Sure. Who is the executive director international of all Scientology. And then there's another gentleman by the name of Mark Yeager, who was the commanding officer of a, a portion of the Sea Organization, 
where people that worked directly for LRH, mm -hmm. they called the Commodore's Messenger Organization. That's like one of the most senior organizations that run Scientology. Yeah. That's also C organization. So Mark Yeager and Guillaume Lesseve. David Miscavige for years would constantly at meetings where there's 20, 15, 20 people going over a project or a film, he would say that Guillaume and Mark are fucking each other in the ass. He would say on a <laughs> constant basis, these two homos are fucking each other in the ass at night, and that's why fucking nothing, they can't get anything done. And he, and David Miscavige, he makes Gordon Ramsay look like freaking Emily Post. <laughs> David Miscavige, David Miscavige, could say a sentence that would be the most vulgar sentence you've ever heard in your life. He could say a sentence, a different sentence like that, a hundred times in the same day and not say the same sentence twice. He was just insanely profane, insanely profane. And he, and he said this one time, in Scientology, all they want to do is become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's, the, that's sort of the... No matter what, that's the guiding principle. It's called expansion. Sure. There always has to be expansion. That's it. Everything is about expansion. If there's any sort of contraction, then heads will roll. And David Miscavige at a meeting said to a whole meeting of people, he said the only expansion that Mark Yeager and Guillaume Lesseve ever caused was by sticking their dicks in each other's assholes. That was the only expansion that they'd ever caused. Well. The, that that the leader the leader of a quote unquote religion said that at a production meeting about the two other guys that are in charge of Scientology. So they're basically the guys he's put in charge for the last 20, 30 years, he's saying this about the next guys. That they're the bosses, and he's saying this about them. So that is that's a that's a Sunday afternoon there. Mm. That this this meeting where he's saying these two guys that in, in Scientology they're super homophobic. Sure. It's this is an everyday occur occurrence where the, the essential leader of Scientology is accusing the 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 executives of the entire organization that they're butt fuckers. Well, that's, that's a yeah, that's that, the reason that, Paul Paul Haggis left, right? Why why would Travolta well, perhaps stay then? Is he blind to all that kind of thing? I don't think he cares. Like, I, if you were John Travolta, I don't know what I don't know what you care about in life. Sure. But if if I gave you, uh, you know, if you had a, a if you have a seven forty seven parked in your front lawn and you had an unlimited amount of money and you had a beautiful wife and you had some kids and you lived on an island or whatever, I don't know how I don't know where David Miscavige being homophobic. I don't know where that ranks in your life as something that you you give a shit about so sure. um it's it's impossible for me to know what why why he would support them why he would put up with it why he there's a million questions on dude you should just not do this anymore because you have a lifestyle or you have uh if you have any sort of uh conscience why yeah. would you support these individuals that uh you know who cares about what people do behind their closed doors no one can like that's the other thing about scientology is they make a big deal out of these significances of what people personally choose to do and and whatever activities they take part in and when you're in scientology it's a huge deal like if they say that you know ethan does this yeah. then you go oh man i can't believe they, they're telling everybody i do this whereas when you get out when you leave scientology and they say oh you're doing this and you're like yeah, so like, <laughs> who cares? Like, like in the real world, it doesn't really matter. And most people, I think it's more acceptable. It's more acceptable now that people aren't so judgmental about every single facet of your life. Sure. In Scientology, they're one hundred percent judgmental about every single aspect of your life. So when you've upset David Miscavige, you're one of the, I guess, the generals or lieutenants there, uh, to paraphrase. Uh, what would happen to you? Would you be sent to reconditioning, re-education, re-audited, beaten up, locked in a room? What would happen to you or it anyone depends else? On, it really depends on how valuable you are to David Miscavige. So in the 15 years that I was there, I probably screwed up all kinds of things, according to them. But I never, 
got sent off to the reconditioning camp, which is called the Rehabilitation Project Force, which is basically where you just do hard labor for a, a number of years and you get a bunch more reprogramming to make you realize that you're a schmuck and you shouldn't be a schmuck. What's the building is there? Is it the hole without windows and they just lock you in there? No, and no. That's, no? A, that? that's, a, that's its own little animal that David Miscavige created just for the international headquarters. Sure. The rehabilitation project force, that takes place all over the world. You could be in Australia and be on the RPF and you could be in Hollywood and be on the RPF. The hole is sort of like the RPF squared. It's like... You, you're, we're, go I'm going to make your life as miserable as I can possibly make it. And there's nothing you can do about it. And if you complain or you try to escape, it's only going to get worse. So and that makes you more susceptible to suggestion, I suppose, if you're sleep deprived or beaten or kind of locked in a room sure. without light. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And a lot of people would say that like, well, why didn't you leave? Or like, where was I going to go? I didn't have a high school diploma. I didn't have any, uh, real world training i never even really lived a long enough in the real world to even know how do you get a job how do you you know do you how do you get an apartment or a house or a bank account or any of those things it was sort of like i'm a spaceman i just landed on the planet and i'm you know i'm 30 plus years old and i don't i don't have i had nowhere to go so sure. when and that's the case with i would say 99 percent of the people that are there you say well why didn't you leave well where was i going to go when i left in 2005, I, I basically submitted to the fact that I'm probably going to be homeless. I'm probably never going to see my family ever again. And all I have are the clothes on my back and my motorcycle. That's literally what I left with, the clo some clothes and a motorcycle and a few hundred bucks in cash. Well, you've got, you got Clara Kors, your longtime girlfriend, now your wife, right? No, uh, no, she was still there. She didn't not, leave with, not she didn't mentioned leave with me. You, but you ever she, never confess your desire to leave or your disgruntlement with the situation? How would they how were they treating relationships in there? Did they know that I, you guys were together? Yeah, no, no, no. We were married for years, but if you say to your spouse, "I'm going to leave," ninety nine percent of the time, your spouse is going to rat you out and say, "Hey, he said he was wanted to leave, and now that's it. You're locked up even more." So, if it's it's one of those things where if you tell somebody you're going to leave, there's a very very good chance that they're going to rat you out. And I attempted to contact her to tell her that I'm, I'm getting out of here. That's it. It's done. And she was pulling an all-nighter, and she was, she was actually counseling another girl. She was doing an interrogation on another girl whose husband had left, and the girl wanted to go live with – go be with the husband. My wife – was trying to convince another girl not to leave with her husband. I didn't. I didn't find this out until afterwards, when she finally, a few weeks later, did escape and join up with me. But um, the irony that that is what she was doing when I attempted to contact her is not lost on me. But, but, um, but yeah, you can't. There, and that's another thing. If if you if your wife or your husband leaves, they know that the spouse is possibly going to try and take off. Mm. So they they go ex they go the extra mile to make sure that person has no way to escape. They as soon as I left, they changed she had a phone, she had a Nextel phone. As soon as I left, they changed her phone cuz they knew I'm just going to call her on the phone and say, "Come on, meet me. I'm ta I'm going to break you out of there." So um, they they did as much as they could and and there's probably a chapter or two in my book that explains my escape and her escape and how even though they made it impossible for her to escape, we somehow were able to squeeze her out of there. And, and even then they intercepted her in Las Vegas. Sure. So they went, they go the extra mile. Well, they, they, I they mean, that part of the book kind of reads like a, it's fiction. I know it happened for real, but it reads like a, an action movie. What was the kind of like, just give us the basic framework of your actual escape physically from the building, because it's surrounded by razor wire, right? It bends inwards, so you can't really get out without injuring yourself severely. Well, uh, on the you own a motorcycle, but how would they not commandeer the motorcycle if they declared you as an SP or someone to kind of on the watch list? How did you did you make several attempts to leave prior to that, or did you just do one big great escape, Steve McQueen style, on the, on the yeah, motorcycle? It was the one big escape. That's actually one of the reasons for the title of the book is that during the 15 years that I was there. I literally saw hundreds of people escape. And 
of probably I'd say 50% of those people were recaptured and brought back to the property. Well, so, bl blown for good. It just explains to me what that is because it was your kind of pseudonym as well on blogs and things for a time, wasn't it? Yeah, so when you, when you blow, that's an unauthorized departure. That's what Scientology deem as a blow. So if you don't show up for work in the morning, they say, oh, Ethan's blown. Right. And they sent out a search party to find you. And like I said, a good majority of those times, maybe half of the times, they get the person back. So there's, there, there are people at that property who've blown up to five times. Like they, they've escaped over and over again, but they always get brought back. So I wanted to make sure that they knew that I was blown for good. They were never getting me back. So that was... <laughs> how that name was created that I'm blown and I'm blown for good. I'm never coming back. And for years I posted on the internet under that name and they didn't know who that was. And I was basically just spilling the beans on what was happening at that property from, from about 2005 to 2009 when my book was published. And the book essentially was all of those things that I had told people about or the things that had happened at the property and a whole lot more in in more detail and so um because you escaped on the bike and then well you're in they I, did they suspect i don't remember this they suspected you leaving so they wrapped the bike in a kind of like mooring was, chain for a, 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 yeah, a, a ship right early. you've got that a 200 early. cc motorbike how did you yeah. escape this place that was earlier they at one point they had suspected this guy's gonna take off so they locked up my bike so it was it was like a big fat chain around it. There's no way I was going to get it off. It was, it was done. But then at, as time passed and I had convinced them that I wasn't going to take off, I moved the motorcycle to my house, which was about a mile from the property. It's right next to the property, but it was there. And it was in the garage, which is parked. I wasn't, a, I wasn't allowed to drive it, but it was parked and it was off the base. It was off base. So there's a number of people that lived right next to the property. And then there was a number of people that lived in apartments um, in the town near where the headquarters were in Hemet or in yeah. San Jacinto. And so when they finally said, oh, you're going to go to the rehabilitation project force and all this other stuff's going to happen. They still said, well, you got to go home and sleep so that you can get interrogated tomorrow. So I did go home Whoops. and I don't. I don't think they factored in that my motorcycle was just sitting in the garage. Mm. So I sort of saw that as a sign. Like, you know what? My bike's here and I'm not behind the barbed wire gates of the property anymore because I've walked right outside those gates onto my house, which is probably a few hundred yards from the barbed wire. And I could escape when I did decide okay that's it i'm gonna do it the person who lived next to me was one of these guys his name was rick his name was rick cruzen and he'd already escaped four or five times previously and they thought he was going to try to escape again so and he was my next door neighbor so the security truck was parked outside of his house all night in, in the case that he called a cab or tried to make a break for it so when i drove out you're outside my, the wrong house. <laughs> I drove out my, my driveway. The security truck was parked right there. They were like, oh, wait a minute. Rick's not leaving, but look, Mark is. Let's follow him. So within 10 seconds of my escape, they were following me. Right. So, and then they tried to get me. They said, come on. You know, they're yelling at me through the window. Come on, come back, come back. And obviously, I've got a bag of clothes on the back of the bike. That's it. The sure. gig's up. They know I'm leaving. I'm not going to... I'm not going to the gas station to get a, a hot dog. You know, I'm, I'm on the run. So when I refused to come back, they just ran me off the road with the security, with a SUV. Jesus. And so they when just, they did, what did they do? Just bump the bike and send you off the road? They, they, they just kept driving and driving until I had nowhere to drive and I crashed. Whoa. And when I crashed, some person my guardian angel some person driving by on the hallway on the highway witnessed this and called the police Whoa. and when they did that that sort of set up in motion all the things that helped me escape but essentially um i fought with the security guards in the street to, they took the key out of my bike after the crash 
and my clothes and stuff were all over the highway. So I had to get all my stuff. Is and no I had to one get driving every... past to either help or stop or ask what's wrong though? No. No, nobody stopped, but somebody called. Right. So how'd and you so get the key back? I I stood in the highway and I started waving my hands at other cars, like I'm waving down help. And when I did that, they threw the key right back to me. They were like, "Oh no, we don't need that." And so I got the key. I got the bike. I had to bump start it. My clutch was broken off, so I had no clutch. It was gone. The clutch handle was not on the bike anymore so i had to shift it into like second gear turn the bike on and i had to bump start it and then i i think the carburetor got flooded something happened so the bike had no uh acceleration i could only basically barely go over idle sure without if i went any over idle it would flood and die so i was driving at five miles an hour down the road <laughs> And the security thing, the security SUV was following me. And then I'm assuming what happened is they heard the call because they have a police scanner they in the, the police security. Bands. Yeah. They heard oh, the call go out of the police band. Oh, there's been an incident on the highway involving a motorcycle and a black SUV. As soon as they heard that call, they just flipped a Yui and they drove back, like speeded back to the property. And I'm here just putting along at five miles an hour down the highway. And within... Within seconds, I would say within 10 or 15 seconds, a, a, a police vehicle came screaming down the highway and d pulled a Yui and then pulled me over. <laughs> so I got pulled over. The, and the cop, I, of course, I'm unaware of the 911 call. I'm, a, I'm unaware of all this at the time. You think you're going to get sent back to the base with the cops, right? That's right. I don't want to cause any trouble. I just want to leave. Because I know if I cause trouble... That's going to make, they're going to make my life miserable. So already there's trouble, but I'm still un, under the mind that I didn't cause this trouble. I'm just trying to escape. They're the ones that ran me off the road. They're the ones that made a scene. So now the police have arrived. So I basically, the, the policeman says we had a, a report that there was an altercation occurring in the, in the hot, in the road and, and the vehicle matches your description a motorcycle guy on a motorcycle and i said no no i'm fine i have mud it's raining and i have mud all over me because i crashed mm. and i ended up in a ditch and the guy's like yeah you've obviously something happened i'm like oh no my friends were just trying to ask me some questions he's like your friends and i'm like yeah yeah he, and he knows for my license my address is the headquarter of the property so he goes oh you're from golden era productions and I say, yeah, yeah, no, my friends were just asking me. So he knows. He's like, this is, and they, there's rumors and stories of people escaping. And the police, everybody knows about this. It's a known thing. Mm. This happens all the time. Anyway, so as soon as he was questioning me, and, we, and he was basically getting down to the fact that I had just escaped, the, the, the public relations person for the property, her name is Muriel, she drives by real slow. <laughs> And he recognizes her immediately because they throw all kinds of banquets and fundraisers for the police. And, mm. and he goes, can I help you? And she goes, what's wrong with Mark? Like she's pretending like to be sympathetic. What happened? And he's like, nothing happened, ma'am. Just move along. He could tell she was from Golden Era. And as soon as she drove out of earshot, he looked at me and he goes, where are you trying to get to? And I said... <laughs> And then at that point, I, I dumped all the pretense and said, I'm trying to get to U-Haul in town, and these guys are going to do whatever they can to make sure I don't get there. And he goes, okay, we're going to escort you. So he called another police car, and they, in front and back of me, they escorted me several miles, especially because I could only go five miles an hour. <laughs> that was nice. They, they escorted me all the way into the, into the nearby town, and got me to the U-Haul, which is where I could rent a truck and put on my, my bike in there and then drive somewhere. I didn't know where I was going to drive to. I just knew now my bike was dead. So I couldn't, my, my plan was to escape on the bike, but yeah. now the bike was inoperable. So I had to get somewhere that I could get a truck to put the bike into. And during the course of that trip to the U-Haul rentals place, two cars from the Scientology compound were following us. And they had to pull them over 
and tell them. The police pulled them over and said, if you keep following us, you're going to be impeding a police investigation and we're going to arrest, uh, you. arrest you. And this all happened. I got to the U-Haul and then they, they ba I basically said, okay, thanks a lot. And they were like, no, we're not leaving until you're in a vehicle driving away where we know you can't be, you know, grabbed and thrown into something and taken away. So, um, so they waited there. They just stood there and waited while I got a truck and while I got everything, got the bike loaded up. As soon as I was loaded up, they were like, okay, good, good luck. And I, and I didn't know any of this was documented until years later, somebody said there is a police, there's a, at least one or two police reports in the Riverside County Sheriff's Department that detail this entire thing that took place. And the police filed it under false imprisonment. That's what the charges they filed this under. And because I never pressed charges and I never did anything, it was just, it was just dismissed. It was just unfounded. Nothing happened. But this entire, that entire thing from them getting called to them escorting me to the U-Haul, including pulling the Scientology personnel over in the vehicles, all of that is documented. If you just Google Mark Headley police report, you can see it's all there. I'll put the, a link the to it under the video. The police were the, – the original officer that pulled me over, he was afraid for his safety mm. if he was going to escort me alone. And that's why he called for backup so that if there was two of them – he thought we'll be okay because who knows what they're going to do. They've already run me off the road. Sure. Who knows? They could do anything unless there's, you know, two vehicles protecting me to get me to where I need to go. You know, he was afraid. And he says that in the police report. He was afraid for his his and my safety. How are you finally reunited with uh, Claire, your wife? Was it? Basically, she a few weeks later, she managed to sneak me a message through an email that they didn't know I had. And she was the only person who knew that I had. And she called a sister of her who is involved with Scientology and told her that I was working on something. And that I my phone, I had a, didn't have a phone. But if if uh, if her sister could email me Claire's new phone number. Mm. So when they replaced my wife's phone, I no longer could contact her. So she got me her new number through her sister who wasn't involved in the Sea Org, but she was a Scientologist. And, um, and then we spoke, and then I basically figured out how we could get her out of there through going to a doctor's appointment. And, you know, through a series of things, we got her out, and then, then the rest is history. Sure. Just before we wrap up, uh, I understand you learned about, I guess, the ultimate secret of Scientology, which is uh, the thing about Xenu by watching South Park. I'm just going to read it to the listeners, which is on Google. Uh, okay. This is one of the main tenets of Scientology. It's at OT level seven. You basically go through operating oh. Thetan levels, right? Which one OT, is it? OT3. OT3. Okay. Well, basically, and it just says uh, Xenu. It's not, or Lord... it's not a main thing either. It's not a main I thing. I never knew about this when I was in Scientology. Well, what, what, what level did you get to? Because there are levels you go up through and you kind of eventually yeah. learn this. It basically just says Xenu was, according to Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, the dictator of the Galactic Confederacy who 75 million years ago brought billions of people, of his people, to Earth in DC-10-like uh, spacecraft, stacked them around volcanoes, and then killed them with hydrogen bombs. Now, that sounds like 50 sci-fi. Now, you didn't know this. I think Claire did, right? Any Scientologist that comes to that level, why would you not go, this is horseshit, and blow or leave? <laughs> it's one of those things. Like, when you're at the casino and you, you've been up 100K, you've been down 100K, you've been up a few hundred K, if you are down 300K and you find out, you know, it's one of those things. Like, you, you got to get your money back. You got to get back up again. You've been up and down. You got to get back up again. And it's, I think, I don't know. There's a thing they call it. It's like invest, return. There's some sort of psychological thing where if you've invested a certain amount and you've lost a certain amount, you're willing to keep investing to get that money back. Is it reasonable to believe there's even crazier stuff than that beyond OT four, five, six, and seven? Oh, yeah. Because Claire, Claire, your wife, knew this. And when you saw the South Park episode about this, yeah, I looked at her like, what the fuck? That can't be true, right? And she yeah, said, and she's yeah. Like, 
And she's basically like, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much it. You know, like, yep. like they obviously it's animated and they throw, they throw a little bit of humor you know, and spin, sweat and stuff. Yeah. They throw a little bit of spit on it, but essentially it is exactly what's in South Park is exactly what is in the, the, the Hubbard writings and the recordings of it. There's a recording on the internet of him saying all this stuff. David and Miscavige believes this, the leader of Scientology and Tom Cruise believes this. I think I I don't know if David Miscavige really believes uh, all the things in Scientology. I think that he knows that if he does, if he puts on that he does, then everybody will go along. Like they're not gonna. If he says, "Oh, this is total bullshit," then that's it. It's gonna fall apart. As long as he keeps putting on the act, there's a lot of people there that hate David Miscavige. Like a lot of these people that they, like these two guys, he's always accusing of, of homosexual activities. They uh, it's my firm belief that they think that L. Ron Hubbard is going to come back. And when L. Ron Hubbard comes back, they're going to tattletale on Dave of all this, all the bullshit he was up to the whole time L. Ron Hubbard was gone. Because and then L. Ron, Hub and yeah. L. Ron Hubbard's going to reward them for being loyal to him. Because there's, no, there's no heaven, right? Yeah. There's no What's heaven. That? There's no heaven or God in Scientology. You, you get reincarnated, uh, right? So they're expecting the return of L. Ron Hubbard. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a mansion built at Gold Base awaiting his return. And every day, clothes are put out fresh every day. Uh, Tom yeah. Cruise has stayed there, right? And, and David yeah, Miscavige yeah. has stayed there. Absolutely. We built. He had a house there when I arrived in 1990, and that house was torn down, and a gigantic mansion, like. I'm trying to think of who has a mansion. Like, it's a nice mansion. It's a multi-million dollar mansion. Like, Tom Brady has a mansion that's like the mansion they built for L. Ron <laughs> Hubbard. Okay? Tom Brady and Giselle have a mansion. Well, they have one. Of, they built one of those that's empty. It's just sitting there waiting for L. Ron Hubbard to come back and occupy it. And, yeah, you're right. They set his clothes out, which since I've left, I've – I've, there's a few holes that can be poked in that. Like, so if he left and he's supposed to return after 21 year leave of absence, how are his old fat clothes going to fit him when he comes back and he's only 20 or 21 or 25 or whenever he's already missed his return date? Would he be he the died? same person or would he be reincarnated into a different body? So how would you, could I just go up to the gold base and say, I'm L. Ron, where's my house? Yeah, that's what my, that's my How'd point. How'd you prove like, it? Yeah, like you're putting his clothes out, like he's gonna come back. He's not gonna. Of all the infinite wisdom he learned, not he. You would have think he would have learned to come back as not a big fat guy. Like that would be, that you. That's got to be one of the takeaways of being immortal was don't come back as a pock faced old fat guy. Come back <laughs> as a, come back as like a, a shiny superstar. Like come back stud. as Tom Cruise. Yeah, like why not come back something like that? Like so. Yeah, no, he died you, in 19... Again, just to reiterate that point, do you think Tom believes that? Because he stays in the grounds or the bungalow of that mansion or the residence itself. Do you think he thinks that? I think that him and David Miscavige think that they are higher beings. For real? That, yeah, yeah. That they are... They're smarter than everybody else. They're better than everybody else. And they are... Next to L. Ron Hubbard they would be number two and three. And Tom thinks that David Miscavige is the second highest being and that Tom is the third highest being. They think that's what they, that's what Tom, he said this to people. He said this to people. So, well, you, we had a flash of that in the video that I guess you were responsible for. And did you make that video in 2005 when it was kind of that puff piece about SP and that's an SP and will an SP even exist? And if I see an accident, you know, a, a million yeah. comedians and like things on YouTube have like aped it as well. Is that the we real did. Tom Cruise or was that him that, then? Yeah, that was the video produced by Golden Era Productions in late 2004, right before I escaped. That w And that video, there's been Scientology tried to say that video has been edited and it's been all chopped up. No, that video is exactly frame for frame how it was put out by Scientology. It's not it's not altered or manipulated in any way whatsoever. It what? is exactly how it was produced. What's he like when you've met him? He's just a intense, hardcore dude. He doesn't put up with any bullshit, and he thinks he's he thinks his shit doesn't stink, and he's pretty much the the top dog. So, <laughs> I think 
Were you around for the auditions or the vetting process when he was looking for a new wife? Is yeah, that, yeah. Is that all true? Yeah, I saw some of those audition tapes myself. That I, I basically walked in on the guy that was cutting those tapes together and was like, what's this? And, and he was like, oh, it's we're working on this project. We're cutting together these auditions of these girls for some Tom Cruise project. We all thought... We I don't want Tom was, Cruise to be crazy. I like Tom Cruise. <laughs> we thought it was for an upcoming Mission Impossible. That's okay. what we thought it was for. We thought, oh, he wants to have a Scientologist be in Mission Impossible, so that's why they're auditioning all these girls. Only, only after I left and after he found Katie Holmes and all this other stuff took place did I realize, you know, like I had a suspicion – that that's what it was, and my wife is like crazy conspiracy theories. Like David uh, David Miscavige is the real father of Surrey and stuff, and like oh no, no, <laughs> not it's not David Miscavige. I know who it is, but it's not David Miscavige. It's not, and it's not Tom Cruise either. What? Um. Anyway, but <laughs> so the the thing is that my wife, when I told her, oh, we were doing, we I saw uh, this guy cutting together all these um, auditions for Mission Impossible, and my wife was like. That's not for Mission Impossible because she was in Religious Technology Center and she was like, no, no, that's to find Tom a girlfriend. And I thought even at the time, I thought, wow, that's so crazy. Like basically David Miscavige is Tom Cruise's pimp in Scientology. I just it's so I mean, I believe this. It's it's crazy, but it's just like you see all these movies and stuff. You think, oh, he's cool. And then all this kind of it's almost like it is a f almost fiction but it's not it's yeah. uh, absolutely fascinating like but this world of but this world of crazy like this is the other thing like there's been the the louis thoreau film that's just about to come out you're in that right going clear yeah yeah i'm in that too the going clear film that came out and there's all the stuff you read on the internet all of that stuff and in my book even all of this stuff that you've read or you've seen it, it doesn't it doesn't even scratch the surface of crazy it doesn't even like my book i my book was it's like i think it's like 300 pages it was 600 pages we cut it down to 300 pages and we took out all the stuff that is it's just like that's impossible that did not happen there's no way that that could take place we had to take all that stuff out because there's things that are going on there like even the thing about David Miscavige saying those two guys, the only expansion they caused was, you know, doing their thing. Yeah. That's that's every day. That's not that's not that's not an exception to the rule. That's what happens on a normal day. The stuff that happens on a crazy day at that place, your head would explode. You would not even be able to comprehend the amount of crazy that takes place at that place <laughs> on a daily basis. So that that you'll see. The more stories, that, that's another thing. You you have ventured into a, a realm of crazy. So I, dude, you, I, I absolutely know. I mean, I, got, I was Tony audited Ortega. 20 years ago, and I thought it was strange. Then I, I left the uh, the auditing session when I, I thought it was market research in Birmingham when I was like 20 years old. Yeah. And they said it was for market research. I went, okay, I've got time to kill. What is it, tasting ketchup? Okay. And I was in there for two hours. I answered a million bizarre questions with this little questionnaire and a pencil then i was audited with the e-meter and it just felt really weird and oppressive and creepy and i wouldn't they wouldn't let me leave and i kind of had to fight to leave when i must leave and i stamped my hand on the desk they let me leave then on the way out they went yeah. would you, do you fancy working for us to get people in to do what i do and i was like what are you this is just absolutely crazy but they kind of they played on my dyslexia i was at drama school at the time they were going oh you want to be an actor john travolta's an actor tom cruise they were alluding to their success being all because of scientology we can cure dyslexia I know it's crazy. I mean, speaking to Tony like a month ago, I know it's crazy. Reading uh, your book years ago and all the other other things I've seen and these like these little secrets sneaking out about Travolta or even Tom Cruise and that little chestnut you've dropped that Suri is uh, <laughs> not not his daughter. I just it's the most unbelievably fascinating thing, and I it, it's I think it's that dichotomy of you see the public persona of someone and then the person you're almost describing, David Miscavige and then Tom Cruise, is like the Emperor and Darth Vader in Star Wars. You've got these forced labor camps that they're used. I, I mean, I've heard you say in interviews before that, that you're completely aware of, aware of. Like Tom Cruise gets his SUV tricked perfect. out and it takes 2,000 hours to do and they strip it down to the frame. Uh, uh, Mr. Brousseau, right? He's the uh, craftsman yeah. that redid Cruise's SUV. 
you uh, decked out uh, Cruz's uh, hangar, didn't you? I didn't, all, I wasn't, I didn't work on that project. All the that Top happened. Gun kind of iconography and things. Uh, yeah, we did all kinds of stuff. Like when I, in the early nineties, there's an audio visual unit that is, it's called LR, LRH, L Ron Hubbard's audio visual unit. It still exists to this day. <laughs> they, they, it's a, there is a unit of people that are Seerg members. All their job is, is to make sure that L Ron Hubbard's record players and stereo equipment are the best they can possibly be. There's a group of people that that's their job description. L. Ron Hubbard died. Are these in record players from back then, though? So you kind of like reconditioning antiques because technology with Scientology can't improve or move forward. And I think I've that's heard exactly. you say that is kind of their undoing in the end because I think you're only only one of the only people on the base who knew what the internet even was. Right? Yeah. Well, um, there were people that knew about it, but they didn't have access to it. They haven't used it. Like even when I bought stuff on eBay, it was like, it, it was like sorcery that I had ordered something and it came from the computer. It, it was like that sort of thing. Like, wow, how did you get that? It's like, yeah, I, 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 I ordered it on Amazon. Is okay. that the case? Because you left in 2005, right? Is that the case even yeah. now? People, only a few people can use the internet. No one knows what's outside of that. I think it's a, probably a little bit more lax, but they have filters. They have internet filters, so you can't see anything bad about Scientology. So you can't look through. up Xenu and what the, no, the tenets no, no, of Scientology are. Yeah. Even if you type in something with an X, you will get a blocked page. So, like, if your name has no an X in then. it. Yeah, if you, yeah, oh, oh that, that's a, I could tell hours of stories about that. But anyway, they have a filter in place that has every single search term that has anything to do with Scientology and now anything with any kind of porn so that if you try to search that, it's blocked. It just says access denied. You can't, it won't even come up. It won't even, you won't even get to the address. It'll just say you cannot access that document or that whatever web page or whatever. But um, so they have a very heavy, heavy filter. There was a, there, I'll just tell you this one last thing because it's a funny story, but. And I don't think I put it in the book. It's the Scientology but, porn. It's just like little gifts of people being thrown was, in rivers and off, <laughs> off boats and things. So there was a guy there, and it was known that he had been caught. He ha he was he worked in a in a in an area that he needed to download technical things from the internet. So as part of his job, he had to have access to the internet. And whenever he would get in trouble, it was always like, oh man, he got in trouble, and it'd be like. We pretty much know what he was doing because whenever you, whenever something goes wrong in Scientology, it's always you've done something wrong. That's mm. the reason why the the if you made a, a DVD and the DVD was flawed in some way, then the reason the DVD was flawed is because you're doing something that's not per Scientology's ethics codes. Could right. be anything. Could be, you know, whatever. But in a, I would say at that property, ninety percent of the time they focus on something that's a sexual perversion or some sort of sexual deviation. Someone's so, on youporn.com. So this guy, they found out, he, he was getting in trouble. They found out, okay, he was going on internet and getting porn. But then it was like a mystery. <laughs> like, well, why, how is he able to access porn? Well, he would just search for porn in a different language than English. So they had English search terms put in there. But he spoke like he knew other languages. So he just searched for, you know, titty and hunger Hungarian. So then he would get, that's how he would get access to it. Cause sure. so every time they get in trouble, they would, every time he would get in trouble, they'd have to add another language of search terms because he would just keep cycling through them. <laughs> it's like, Oh, Swedish. Oh, Hungarian. Oh, French. <laughs> oh, German. Oh, Russian. So, Anyway, I just thought that was a funny story. But they they keep having they would keep having to update the filter to keep up with this guy's porn habits. <laughs> well, the people controlling the filter are probably uh, doing the same, uh, I guess, crimes, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I did put that in the book where they're the people that were like the watchers or the administrators over the filter could see the activity that was happening, and they could see that there was only two of these people who oversaw at the property. <laughs> and they could both see, they could both see that the other one was going to porn sites, oh and they were the police of the internet at the property, and they were both going on porn. And I didn't know this at the time. I knew one of the guys got in trouble, but then after we left, my wife told me, "Oh no, that other guy 
because she he worked in a religious technology center. Sure. His name was Warren McShane. He's a very well known um, person within the Scientology community as one of their big legal um, people that shows up for cases and he gets depositioned and, and that, that sort of thing. And he was one of the police, the internet police at the property. And and he had the same thing happening in religious technology center. Whenever something would go bad on a case or on some legal thing, David Miscavige would be like, "Oh, Warren's on the porn again." And they knew. <laughs> They knew, and he, and he had unfiltered access. Right. So they couldn't they couldn't update the filter for him because he was one of the guys that was responsible for updating the filter. So. Oh my God. Well, uh, just for a wrap up, I'm just gonna say thank you so much, Mark. Uh, you're one of the people when I first started this show. I earmarked that I wanted to talk to. I actually think I found out more about Scientology from watching any other video with the kind of like little bombs you've dropped. Now I'm even more <laughs> more like. <laughs> it really is the craziest thing ever. Uh, uh, anyone listening, Mark's book, Blown for Good, uh, you can get on Amazon, right? Do you sell it direct yeah. at all? Um, I, do, it? I do, but uh, you can go to uh, blownforgood.com yeah. or you can just go to Amazon because it's on uh, Kindle, paperback, hardback. You can get it any which way you want on uh, Amazon. And I think they have it in Amazon in the UK as well. Yeah, because this chat is really kind of, it's only the tip of the iceberg, the stuff Mark's talked about in this show uh, that's in the book. It's utterly fascinating. Uh, <laughs> just... Oh, the Tom Cruise stuff has tickled me completely. Now I'm even more kind of like, uh, I'm in a spin. Uh, one final question, Mark. Do you still practice Scientology then? Have you kind of left it behind? Do you still employ some of the tenets of its, uh, not belief system, but kind of like the, the learning tools or the life tools that you kind of learned doing it? No. I mean, even when I was there, I was working. Right. I was not, I wasn't there to be a, a practitioner. I wasn't getting counseling and, studying a lot about Scientology, I was making stuff that they sold for money. That was my job. So when I left, and and also that's the other thing, when you see, it's sort of like when you see, when you go to the visit the wizard and you see behind the curtain, it's impossible to go, oh. Take any of it seriously anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. impossible to think that there really is a magical wizard when you've seen behind the curtain. And and I've seen behind the curtain for 15 years. So I know there's there's no magic. It's all just trickery. And that's another big thing about Golden Era Productions. Golden Era Productions, it's a production organization. We were making sets and props, makeup, costumes. It's all make-believe. Yeah. That's what our job was. Our job was to make this look real. And that essentially is all of Scientology. It's a big, giant pretend make-believe thing. Do you think it'll be and, around in five or ten years? I mean, you're obviously doing great work uh, getting your story out, not just this avenue, but on larger platforms like Louis Theroux and stuff and going clear. Do you think there's... How many years left do you think Scientology has, or will it just carry on and carry on and carry on? Do I we, think right now what their their biggest problem is they're having a mass exodus within their within their members so the C organization, it doesn't seem to be getting so much smaller. They're not losing a ton of people there. It's the members, which I'd say they worldwide, I can't imagine they have any more than thirty or 40,000 people that are active in Scientology. Right. Uh, like I said before, there's a lot of those people that are they ha they're very wealthy. And that's really the only thing that's keeping it going is these 1,000 wealthy members that just can keep paying the bills. And Scientology has amassed a great deal of wealth over the years right. through not paying taxes and stuff like that. So it's really just a matter of how much how much longer can they milk the amount uh, the money that they have and the and the core members. And it's also the thing that I the one thing that I think is their weakness is the internet. And through the internet, they're getting lawsuits. So. There's a lot of Narconon lawsuits. There's a few Scientology lawsuits floating around. If somebody can poke a chink in that armor and get them to start paying out money to mm. to basically make things right for people that they've wronged, sure. that that could essentially speed up how long. But it's the they say they're the fastest growing religion in the world. They're really the fastest shrinking cult in the world. That is an accurate description. Sure. Well, I mean, we're going to switch off now, but uh, if I've not, if I'm still unfiltered at Gold Base or anyone has access to this is in Scientology, do you have any th uh, advice or a message for those kind of people, Mark? 
I, I, for a message to anyone involved with Scientology is get out as soon as you can. Your life will be much more happy and wonderful once you leave. And uh, nothing that they say will happen to you will, in fact, happen to you when you leave. You will be happy. It is possible to be happy. And it is possible to be successful and, and live a wonderful life outside of Scientology. And if you can do that, the sooner the better. Cool. Okay, everyone, thank you all for listening. Mark, thank you so, so much. It's been my favorite Thanks. one so far, I think. Thanks. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just in, a, Thanks, I'm in shock. Uh, yeah, Blown for Good, the book is available at blownforgood.com, right? And you can get it on Amazon. I'll put a link to uh, both those links under the video, and we'll uh, see you on the next one. Hopefully, we can get Mark back on, because I only got through about... Pfft, 50% of my questions here. So we will do a sequel, I hope, one day. Uh, Mark, thank you so much, dude. I love you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I'll talk to you next time. All right, brother. Thank you. Mm -hmm.